um, it'll be throughout the year. Um, I think uh, probably like later this year or um, early next year, we're going to do another CK Hackathon. So we hope like this is going to be a long term effort. All right. Um, thanks everyone for coming. And let's give a round of applause to um, Daniel Wan, um, co founder of Tycho. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, these days people are talking a, a lot about ZK, right? There are a lot, of, a lot of fancy ZK terms, and we usually just lose the big pictures. And people don't really realize, you know, what Tyco is trying to offer as a ZK rollout, right? Because although ZK is really fancy, but uh, at the end of the day, ZK is just offering a validity proof that you can trust, right? But if you just assume there's a given like trustworthy ZK proof, how do you design a rollup that's you know that can be used by a lot of like scenarios, right? So I'm going to just take a little bit deeper into uh, Tycho's protocol design. This design is actually uh, going to be launched in about a month. So the current testnet is still using uh, the previous design. <coughs> Click. All right, so. We want to maximize the level of decentralization. So from day one, we decided to use this base rollout design. But two years ago, there's no such a term called base rollout. But Tyco has been always base rollout because we feel like we just want to use the um, L1 validator to propose block. Um, so people sometimes ask me, you know, when are you going to decentralize your sequencers, right? We don't have these uh, sequencers to decentralize because there's no special node. You know, it's always the uh, Ethereum validator who will decide the, the sequencing of transactions and the blocks uh, of, of Tyco. So there's no special nodes, there's no consensus algorithms that we need to introduce, nothing. So that also means going forward is if there's better like a, a protocol enforced, like proposal commitments, a patsy, uh, or even nowadays we can work with like eigenlayer to use restaking to incentivize our, our one validator to, to help you know, build tackle blocks. All right, so we deploy a set of protocol smart contracts on Ethereum. And these, pro these protocols, uh, sorry, these smart contracts manage a, a ring buffer. So you see as a, as a queue, but it's actually a ring buffer that we can like reuse, right? Every time you write something to Ethereum, it's expensive. So by, using the, by reusing the slots, you will reduce the gas a lot. So when we propose a block, I think it's only like a 30,000 K like gas per block. So it's really inexpensive. So, uh, so let's say um, click. Uh, so let's say you have uh, three blocks proposed. They will be put into this queue one by one, one after another. Um, click, and then in the one natural question is like, if we don't have a, a consensus algorithm, right? What if these three blocks are proposed by three different proposers uh, without you know uh, knowing each other, and uh, those blocks may contain the same transactions, right? That's the natural question to ask. Okay. So it may, what may happen is like this. You, know, you imagine you being the first proposer of block A, you imagine your block A is the first one, but it ends up with the, as, a, as a third one, right? So that's, that could happen. Okay, so Tycho actually defines a set of rules on layer two among the Tycho nodes. Say, okay, given any block, you can map it into a actual block on layer two. Um, and of course, given this block and all the previous block, right? If you know the order of your block, this mapping is going to be deterministic uh, and it's immediate. So, so from this perspective, any block, once proposed into the previous queue I mentioned, or the ring buffer, uh, is finalized. All the transactions here will be even deemed as invalid or valid, but this, this like consensus is reached by all the nodes. So once pr proposed, the user will know, you know this transaction is not revertible, it's, it's done, right? Although the, the zero knowledge proof part is not done yet. Okay. So the worst case scenario, of course, is like all the transactions in this proposed block is invalid because somehow it's got all, all of those transactions are included in the previous transaction proposed by another like validator, right? So in that case, it, there's an empty block. But what I'm trying to say is for every proposed block, you can always derive a valid Tycho block on layer two. Okay. 
So this is just one example of those three blocks being mapped to or derived to the accurate L2 uh, blocks. But let's say if they switch the order, uh, let's click again, and then the same set of transactions in each proposed block will map to different uh, layer two uh, blocks because some are valid in this order, but some are valid, you know. Uh, all right. So now we have uh, this called a serene rollup, right? If this is a fancy term, but actually not a lot of people are talking about this. So what it, what the serene rollup is, um, you you have consensus on the among the layer two nodes about you know uh, the state of the of this layer two after each block. Right, so you know that. So basically, it, you have a functional uh, layer two as a blockchain, right? Because everybody, all the nodes know what's going on, right? So that's a blockchain, right? Yeah. Consensus. However, it's really hard to convince L1 to say right, what's the current state. Um, so the L1 smart contracts doesn't know anything about L2 uh, state, block state, except the first one. The first one is like hard coded into the protocol, right? So. Uh, with sovereign rollup, you cannot do like cross-chain um, communication or app easily. You can still do that. Like uh, uh, the project we are working with, uh, with the campaign, what's the name? Uh, Hyper, the, 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 Z, the ZK enabled uh, cross-chain bridge. Like ZK, poly, poly, polyhedra. Like poly, if you de deploy polyhedra here and also on Ethereum, you can, achieve this interchain communication, right? But not so easy, it's still quite expensive, all right? So our goal is to make sure, you know, communication or bridging is easy, right? So that's why we need zero knowledge proof. And, and so for each zero knowledge proof, you are not going to pr prove a block. You are proving a like transition that you feel like is the right transition, right? So different people can provide different uh, um, proofs even for the same block. Because if they believe in different transitions, right? So for this transition from 102 to 103, the prover basically say, okay, I believe this for this block, the parent has should be this value, and given all the transactions in this proposed block, uh, the block has should be 103. So this is like a, like assertion backed by zero knowledge proof. All right. So here I want to show that you can approvers can prove block three first. Right? These two provers, they believe in different transitions. So they you know, place two like, different proofs there. Both are valid, okay? Uh, because they be both have the same, uh, uh, sorry, different assumptions. All right, so now you can prove block two, and then now you can prove block, uh, uh, block one and, sorry, um, block one, right? So w once this first block is proven, you notice that you know, this is the genesis block, right? And then you have this, this proof, this transition, claiming the parent is 100, which is the same one as this one. So now you can connect the dots, right? And this one is deemed trustworthy, or we, we call it uh, verified. So now you can see the, the first block is also verified. So this, this block hash is considered to be like, uh, verified or, or finalized, the, the real finalized. You cannot, it, the smart contract on layer one can trust this value, right? So you can use this value to do like breezy. All right, so if you keep going, uh, you know, all these three blocks will be finalized one after another. Uh, sorry, click. Uh, one more. Okay, and these two efforts are wasted because they're not connected from the parent. So they are still like valid in terms of, if, they're, if their assumption is valid, these Zero knowledge proof are valid, right? But it doesn't mean it's the right one to use. Um, all right. So <clears throat> um, we have been working on different approaches to uh, prove blocks. So I'm going to talk about a little bit how, how you can secure someone to prove your block if you propose those blocks. Um, so with the current version, uh, sorry, with the next testnet, this is what's going to happen. So you propose, before you propose block, you have to talk to a lot of um, potential provers, say, okay, this is the block I'm, I'm going to propose. How much do you want from me as a proving fee, right? You collect all the quotes from as many potential provers as possible. It's just like, it's very like the, the flash bot approach, right? And you select the best one based on your own criteria. Maybe you have a business agreement with a, a pool of ZK provers, or you just use the, the most inexpensive one, right? So once you get that, 
um, then um, the the counterparty just signed a uh, like a small contract, like assigned. We call it uh, prover assignment. So this is verifiable on chain, and then you use that assignment to propose this block. Uh, so this assignment, or you can see it as a social contract between the prover and proposer, basically just say this. Um, you need help? You need help? No, okay. So basically it says, okay, the proposer pays some ease, or actually any tokens, even NFTs, but in this example I just say like 0 0.1 ease. So uh, let's say I'm the proposer, and, and Miko, uh, my co-worker co is the prover, I'm going to pay Miko like 0 0.1 ease as a proving fee immediately. And Miko deposit a lot of tokens, say, okay, I promise you I will pro uh, prove your block within a certain like, like time window, right? And if I can do that, if, if I successfully prove your block, I get my uh, deposit or bond back, uh, ending up with only this 0 0.E as a proving fee, right? If I cannot prove or didn't prove your, uh, your block within that time window, my, my bond is slashed, it's burned, and, you, and the protocol can use that bond to pay other people who, who are going to prove the block. Okay. Um, so one question to ask is, you know, what if Miko didn't, you know, he did fail to prove my block? You know, this block is going to remain unproven forever, or what's going to happen, right? So if um, the assigned prover, um, next, um, fail to prove the block within the time window, then the block is deemed open. Being open means that anyone can prove the block without like a bond, right? And this, this turns into a, like, a competition of speed. You know, whoever is the fast prover will win the block, right? But previous, before the block is open, it's like one effort only uh, dedicated to proving one single block. No wasting of resources to proving the same block. So, because we want to minimize the cost per transaction on layer two, so we feel like, you know, POW is not the right way to go. All right. So the block is going to be open if the, uh, you know, the time window is, is, is gone, or, or um, if the assigned prover is so quick, he proved the block within like 10 minutes, for example, then other people can still prove, uh, propose, like, sorry, to, to submit more proofs if they believe the assigned prover's proof is incorrect, right? Okay. So now this is the tokenomics. So you, you, as a proposer, you receive transactions fee from layer two, right, in ease. All the, all the transaction fees are in ease in, in Taiku. And then you pay uh, ease to the prover or any other tokens, or even no tokens, no payment on chain, you can do like off-chain payment, that's also okay. And then we realized initially uh, the L2 transaction fees won't be good enough to cover the fee, uh, the proving fee, which is probably like $10, $5, who knows, right? Uh, and you probably make like one dollar here. So we will mint additional Taiko token as the block reward and gradually reduce this to zero later. And the prover deposit uh, the bond and once successfully approved the block, return the bond, ending up with uh, ease as the, as the fee. All right. And uh, as I said, um, if uh, he failed to prove the block, then the bond is going to be burned partially and, and partially given to these open provers or backup provers. And, and multiple of those are working on the same task. One of them is the winner, right? The other will waste the resource. But eventually, they collectively, they get more, more than this uh, uh, assigned prover uh, if the block is open. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the most important part. We have talked to a lot of potential uh, um, app chain developers, and they say, okay, a ZKP seems cool. If I really need to prepare like 100 machines to secure my blockchain, I don't want to do that because my chain is just app chain you know, for game. I don't think ZKP for every block is really necessary. How about you don't require ZKP for every block, and then later, if the game is become so big, so profit, profitable, then you, you know, allow me to secure my asset, right? <clears throat> so that's the idea. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so this is like the original design. You, you trust in math. You, you always require zero knowledge proof. And now we say, okay, what's, what if we take an uh, extreme? Like, let's reconsider the optimistic roll-up approach, right? You change this uh, ZK pro, uh, proof into like optimistic proof, which is no proof, right? But it was, let's just call it proof. So basically, you say, okay, I believe this block is 
a parent has is this value, and this block has should be this value. I don't prove it, but I deposit a, a really large value of, of token, then I'm ready to be challenged, right? So, um, <clears throat> so this is basically the, the block, like the transition assertion uh, with, with bound. Um, so if, if there's no challenge at all within like, for example, 30, uh, 60 minutes, right? We think this, this transition can be used to, find, to verify the block, all, all right? Um, if there's, there's a challenge there um, or a contest there, um, then we need a higher level proof, right? A DK proof, right? Or some other proof, a, a, a proof that is more expensive but more trustworthy, right? So that's the idea of like, a, like the, the challenging uh, approach. Um, so, uh, so this is the example. If everything is fine here, no challenge, then after uh, one hour, uh, each will be verified right, as expected. In most cases, this, this is, will, will be the case, right? But let's say this one is challenged, and then we need a zero-knowledge proof for it. Right? This is where you have to generate zero-knowledge proof. Um, and there are two, uh, two possible outcomes. One is this is proven to be the correct one. Um, so the, um, the challenger, maybe we should change the term to use like contester or something. Um, so, that, so, that, so the contester uh, is wrong, and then we slash his tokens, right? Oh, by the way, when, when, you, so when you challenge something, you always need to put some token there. Uh, so wh whoever is the right right person you know, will get the token back and extra, with extra uh, reward. Um, okay, so the, the, uh, the other case is the challenger is correct, and this original prover is wrong, and his uh, proof is going to be slashed. All right, so this is, the, this is very similar to optimistic rollup, but with a very different uh, proof. So optimistic rollup, they, they try to prove something is wrong. Like, I challenge you, I need to get a proof ready, say, you are wrong in this transaction, this opcode or something, right? So that's the fraud proof approach. But we are not trying to prove something is wrong, we are trying to prove something is correct. That means if someone is going to challenge this transaction, he doesn't even have to get the right transaction. He just, just say, okay, this is wrong, right? And once the zero knowledge proof comes, it will tell you what's, what's right. All right, okay. So with this approach, you can configure your chain to be like uh, having zero knowledge proof required per like, like every 100 blocks or randomly like 100% block, right? Oh, sorry, 1% 1, 1 of the blocks need TK. All right. Uh, yeah, all proofs are validity proof, not fraud proof. And uh, the reason that it is so important to keep like a small percent of pro uh, blocks to be TK is because when you need TK, the prover is better there, ready to serve, uh, to, to generate those proofs. Otherwise, if you, you know, for a year there's no challenge at all, you try to find a ZK person, it's gone, it's nowhere, right? You have to make sure they are still in the game. Okay, so let's talk, talk about multi-proof. So as I said, you know, being optimistic uh, a transition, there's no proof at all, right? But let's say we just consider it as, as a proof, right? This is going to be a better proof, right? And then you can add something in, in the middle. Once, sorry, w once this is challenged, um, it's going to be converted into higher tier proof, right? So that's the idea. But you don't have to just have a binary configuration. You can say, okay, this is the least trustworthy one. This is the, you know, the, the really uh, most trustworthy one. And in the middle, we add something which is still a f uh, validated proof, but it's based on the Intel PE, you know, the SDX, uh, you know, and then you try to trust Intel uh, a signature, right? So this is also possible. But sometimes, you know, even we also question whether the DK proofs can be trusted during the first couple of years because, you know, the code base is so large and nobody can say there's no bug, right? So we cannot just say, okay, uh, trust DK and once there's a bug, it's sorry, we are not going to be responsible for that, right? So we have to always assume during the first few years, DK is, is not bug free. And then, given the new like development in ZKVM, maybe we can quickly de develop like multi ZK proof, right? So the multi ZK proof can work in two fashions. One is like you have three proofs, uh, all three pass, and the other one is like you have three proofs, but uh, two of them pass, right? 
So we can have different approaches, but in, at the end of the day, you see it as one unit, and you see you 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 tell yourself this one whether this one is better than this one. You you know you re rearrange this spectrum, right? Okay. Uh, so with these settings, you can say okay, ten percent um, random blocks are SGX as a minimum level of uh, proof, one percent zk. 0.1% uh, as the multi-ZK proof. Um, so if you only uh, configure this chain to accept optimistic rollup, uh, sorry, optimistic proof, then you have this current optimistic rollup. This is what Arbitrum and uh, um, Optimism, they are, they are offering, right? They don't have real functional fraud proof, right? They are working on that, they don't have that. So this is what they are offering. Okay, if you have this and ZK, then this is an optimistic rollup with ZK backing up, right? Th this is what they are trying to do, right? Yeah. Um, okay, and if you have this, you have a what I call a validity proof. So basically, every proof has a valid, uh, every block has a validity proof, right? But uh, it's not really decentralized, right? You have you still have trust assumptions on, on Intel chips, right? But this is better, right? And if you just create config this one. This is the classic, like our current testnet is using this approach, right? And uh, for Tyco, we are going to, our main night launch, we are going to focus on this part of the spectrum. So with ZK and hopefully multiple ZKs, right? So this is good. Um, okay. Um, so for gaming uh, you know, apps, ga game app chains, so you probably start with the low end and you gradually change it, right? Okay. And there's, you can always say, you know, even multi ZK may still hold bugs, right? So if that's the case, you introduce like a multi seek guardians who are controlled by a DAO or that by multi parties as the last resort, right? This is of course not looking good from a technical perspective. You can say, okay, you are still centralized, but I think it's better than losing a lot of money and tell your user, sorry, there is nothing we can do. You have to trust in that. Who has bugs, right? Okay. All right. So you have multiple options. So, so um, we have launched four Tyco test nets. Uh, two of them are still uh, in running, up and running. Um, so uh, this is um, L two. This is L two on L two. So it, it makes L three, right? Same code base redeployable on top of each other. Previously, we tried to market this as the inception layer. Um, so, um, so these are the two, but they are going to be like shut down very soon. And uh, um, on the 18th, we are going to launch a L3. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, L2, a new test net. So this test net will honor, will adapt the um, the tokenomics that I have been talking about, but not this hybrid uh, kind of like a unified design yet. And in um, October, we are going to um, launch a new L2. Which will incorporate all the design element that I have mentioned. Okay, and uh, there's also uh, another test net um, in ideally in Q4 this year, but maybe in uh, Q1 next year, depending on the Duncan sharding, uh, which is the blob transaction, you know, hard fork. So we will need to change our protocol to use the blob data right, because it, it's cheaper. Uh, yeah, so it's really hard to to label Tyco. So you can say well, Tyco is a type one ZK EBM from a developer experience perspective. Tyco is a Ethereum layer two. Tyco is a like hybrid or, or unified or uh, contestable uh, validity rollup. There are so many terms. It's kind of hard for me to market our our product. You know, it's 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 cool. Too many terms. Yeah. So. Um, but I think uh, I want to deliver this message to AppChain developers. You know, using Tyco is highly uh, flexible, it, it's configurable. Uh, not only before you launch the network, it's afterwards, you know, you can always dynamically change the configuration to, um, you know, to, you can always start with an optimistic approach and then end up with a pure 100% ZK rollout approach. So it's, it's your call whether you want to use certain components there, right? And for us, even the Tyco token is optim uh, optional. You can use, for example, if you use like an eigenlayer or um, like, like Pepsi in the future to 
enable I want validator to propose something, you can use your own token. You, you can use staked ether uh, to promote, right? To, to incentivize um, uh, proposers. Um, I guess that's a lot, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.